Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the special lecture series dedicated to a better understanding of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Eastern and Central Europe at large. My name is Martinas, and today with Yone, we will moderate this lecture. We are both master's students at the Design Academy Eindhoven. Urged by the devastating events in Ukraine, we, together with Agnieszka from Social Design Department, the daily lecture series, and with the help and contribution of many others, have initiated special lectures and events. They are all devoted to discussing the political, historical, and cultural circumstances of the current war in Ukraine and the region at large. The AE Lecture Series, as a part of Design Academy Eindhoven, is a student-led initiative. The committee brings leading practitioners from the field of design, art, craft, career education, the humanities, and science. By bringing in diverse perspectives, the goal is to create a space for critical debates and thinking about how our practices relate to current and ongoing societal discourse. These special events will span across two lectures, one panel discussion during April and May. On Tuesday, we had Tadeusz Szywanski, who led us through Ukraine's political and historical background and its relation to the region. For today's lecture, we invited Madina Tlostanova, who will address the issues of global coloniality, the imperial difference, and the trajectories of the former socialist Eastern European nations. The panel discussion on the 12th of May will aim to generate clarity on how this information and propaganda should be questioned and ask how we should, how we should better navigate, navigate it through the social media. Today is the 57th day of war in Ukraine on February 24th. Uh, 2022, Russia reached another stage of its colonial and imperial politics by starting a full-scale war in Ukraine. This war and its devastating consequences have affected many, from individuals to institutions and political conglomerates. For some, it has been a critical point to reassess one's creative endeavors and positioning, and moreover, relation to power structures, fragility and complexity of how language, symbols, and narratives are created and used. Since we are touching on sensitive topics, I would kindly ask everyone to be respectful and thoughtful to other participants while contributing to the discussion. Um, also feel free to have your cameras on. I think it will be a support for us and for Medina. And, but please mute yourself until we start Q&A session so you can pose a question. You can also comment and write a question in the chat. And now shortly about our guest. Uh, Marina Tlostanova is a colonial feminist verbal artist and professor of post-colonial feminisms at the Department of Thematic Studies, Gender Studies at Linköping University in Sweden. She focuses on decolonial thought, post-socialist human condition, activism, feminisms of the global South, critical future studies. She has authored 12 scholarly books and 285 articles translated into several languages. Please welcome Madina Tlostanova. Thank you very much for this generous introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's an honor. It's, I mean, I'm very, very pleased that you invited me, but as I said, it's also very hard for me to talk about this topic. It's not only sensitive, it's devastating and um, it creates a lot of um you know tensions sometimes hatred is quite understandable of course in the situation of such an appalling war appalling invasion as we are witnessing the world is witnessing in the last almost two months by now and at the same time uh i mean it's also uh it's also quite logical that people are now you know getting interested in what's going on in this region that normally is not in the center of anybody's attention. And I can see a lot, for example, here in Sweden, that people don't even know where Ukraine is uh, geographically, uh, where it is situated. And so now this is unfortunately the time that through the war and through the suffering of millions of people, the world finally learns something about Ukraine and um, also um, about Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, Southeastern Europe. And this is a very interesting region. And I must say that I don't like regional studies. I don't do any sort of uh, you know, area studies because I find it to be an area 
um, or let's say studies uh, that I connect to the Cold War uh, thinking and cold woman. So I want to get out of that. Uh, but at the same time, when we think still in regional terms, it's interesting that this is a region that uh, kind of falls out of anything, you know. And uh, when we speak about the existing uh, and popular uh, schools of today, such as post-colonial studies, for instance, or critical studies, uh, and even the global left, very often these are the regions that are almost non-existent or their opinions and their views are considered to be secondary, unimportant, um, you know, mimicking. Uh, and um, since I've been working for quite a long time with uh, both post-socialist feminisms and not only feminisms, but also arts and, uh, you know, some social issues also and uh, um, social activism, uh, as well as post-colonial. Uh, and uh, for me, it's, it's most interesting to see how these two human conditions intersect and how can you be both post-socialist and post-colonial. But this is actually a condition that not uh, many people until recently addressed. Uh, and it was possible to be either post-colonial and exist within the post-colonial paradigm, so to say, or to be within uh, the post socialist, very descriptive um, kind of, you know, area studies research. And that I always found to be problematic. Uh, and that's why, I mean, I wrote a lot of texts on that. And also, we did recently a book with two of my colleagues, Ruchita Parbjorket and Reddy Kobak, um, uh, on these possible dialogues or lack of dialogues and the, the reasons for that between post colonial and post socialist feminists and feminisms. And um, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is another opportunity and chance for us to actually go deeper into these issues and see how the situation of Eastern Europe, uh, and particularly post-Soviet Eastern Europe, I mean, the one that used to be part of the Soviet Union, uh, like Belarus or Ukraine, right, or Moldova, uh, you see, to see how, how this situation um, kind of fits into the global coloniality, and I will explain in a minute what is that, uh, but at the same time is also different, is very unique, and that's why none of the existing schools of thinking that originated in other places are able actually to explain this situation and to make sense of it fully. And that's why it's very important to hear the voices and to allow people from these regions to actually have a voice and to say something and to write something and to listen to them, not in, in the capacity of victims, not as objects of someone else's research, but as people who are able to formulate their own positions and who know their own history and can make sense of it in, in, in this very specific and nuanced way. And this is something that hasn't been done so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, it's probably happening now, but uh, we don't really know. So, I mean, this is important to keep in mind before we actually go into, uh, into any discussion of coloniality. So, um, let me maybe start with, with coloniality and let me share my slides with you. Uh, coloniality is uh, important as a concept here, uh, if we speak about the situation in, um, in Eastern Europe, because uh, it's a term that is different from colonialism, it's different from descriptive historical concept of colonialism, uh, which you find usually in um, post-colonial studies and historical studies. And this term was coined um, in the early 1990s by Peruvian sociologist uh, named Anibal Quejano. Uh, you see his name here on the slide. Um, and um, he needed this term to actually differentiate it from colonialism, historical phenomenon. Uh, and here you see that. Uh, I mean, it's Dina, a... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you put the full screen? Yeah, we can put full screen. Um, so it's a special type of imperial colonial relations that emerged in the Atlantic world in the 16th century and brought together. Uh, launching what we know today as modernity uh, as an overarching global project. 
So, uh, in, in, according to the colonial thinking, there is no modernity without colonialism. There is always a darker colonial side in the modern project, and that's why it's not possible to divide them and say that there. Let's only talk about positive sides of modernity and see on the other more enlightenment and progress, uh, because all of this would not have been possible without the darker colonial side. Uh, and what is crucial, of course, in the colonial option is rationalized. The, ra the racial side, the racialization, the racial taxonomizing uh, uh, that uh, was used from the very beginning, from the 16th century, as a way of dividing humanity and structuring it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it leads us to the way knowledge is produced, to the management of knowledge uh, uh, and um, both production and distribution, and to the way people's subjectivity uh, and sexual and gender identities were being shaped. Uh, and um, so the Anibal Kehano comes with this idea in the 1991, I think, and then it was translated also to other languages much later, because first, of course, it was published in Spanish. And what is important for me, uh, uh, especially today, when we look back at, at this whole school of the colonial thinking that was mostly Latin American in the beginning, is that these ideas were formulated at a very uneasy moment of the collapse of the state socialist system in the world and the moment when the global left was in a very kind of uh, you know pessimistic situation let's say and um, uh, many of the previous social utopias uh, were completely discredited at that point uh, and of course the socialism itself as the last grand social utopia of the 20th century uh, was considered defeated uh, uh, and the arrival and the assertion of neoliberal global capitalism as the only legitimate narrative on the planet. So that is a very low moment to which Anibal Quijano comes with this idea of colonialidad in Spanish or coloniality as it has been translated into English. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps for this reason, uh, it deals more not with the political issues of the, you know, the necessity of decolonizing or decolonization movement, but more uh, with the idea that we should work with the way people think and the way they perceive the world. And that's why the most uh, maybe crucial elements of the colonial thinking, they deal with knowledge production, with epistemic issues and with aesthetic issues. Uh, and it was like that for quite a long time, and it's still like that, I would say, although there are some exceptions. Uh, and uh, it can be, I mean, it's understandable, as I said, because it arrives at the moment of the end of the Cold War. But at the same time, it can be a trap for thinkers, especially if they are academic thinkers, because it can lead to a certain depoliticization and to kind of, you know, a gap between what you write as a researcher and what uh, actually happens in the world and with the world and with the people. Uh, and so uh, I will try to explain why I see some problems with that. But here in, on this slide, you can, you can see actually the two quotations from Anibal Tejano and from uh, a, a figure that you might know because this is a very famous mainstream figure, Francis Fukuyama, who in this case represents uh, a kind of a Western um, idea and framework, uh, neoliberal of course, uh, uh, who wrote uh, an infamous article and on a book uh, precisely at the moment of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, where he refers to it as the end of history. And that's also a very important context in which this idea of coloniality emerges. And why am I talking about this? Is because I, as, a, as a, a person also who was growing up in the Soviet Union, and uh, I was, I mean, I was 20 years old when the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, it was a very uneasy moment in which we sort of still believed that something could be different and a different country could emerge, and probably a democratic country if we are trying to make try hard and we work hard on that. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it was a very different for, moment from now, because now there are no opportunities. Everything is closed. There is no future uh, for, for Russia, for instance, right? So it's going to again collapse, I think, that's what is coming. Uh, 
But at that moment, it felt different. And at the same time, as somebody being non-Russian, belonging to a different ethnicity, being an internal other in Russia, being always racialized and seen as a second-rate person, I was really interested in trying to think, who am I and what am I going to be in this new country that is trying to turn from an empire into a nation state and what sort of nation state it would be. Now, of course, we realize that it never became a nation state, but in fact, that in fact, Russia was always trying to maintain its imperial status or re revamp it in different ways. Uh, and uh, for this reason, of course, uh, it never changed the shape of the idea of, uh, let's say, civil identity, national identity, precisely because it has an imperial identity set. And that's also an interesting topic to investigate. Uh, but I was looking for some keys, theories that would explain to me this nationality, this political borderness of the business that uh, I occupied between the US and the people in Russia, that all of a sudden that stopped being Soviet, but at the same time, oh, we were not Russian, so we were infected by that. Uh, and I found many theories, and one of them was, of course, postcolonial theory, uh, which was interesting, but I found that postcolonial theory was too. Um, Anglo-centric uh, and Franco-centric, so it described very well what was happening, um, uh, what was happening in um, uh, you know the colonies, uh, but it actually failed to explain anything about what happened to Eastern Europe, for instance. And actually, until very very recently, post-colonial studies never tried, never included it. And for me, that was an interesting issue. Why? And then at some point, I started investigating and talking with different people from the global south, very important figures in post colonial theory. And at some point, I realized that uh, one reason probably was that most of them were connected with socialism and with socialist thinking in, in different ways and broader with leftist thinking. And so, even if they were very critical of the Soviet Union and the socialist such socialist system, they still uh, had some nostalgic thoughts about, it, you know, as a social utopia. And that's why for them it was very hard to kind of put an uh, equation mark, um, you know, between socialism and colonialism. They could not believe that any socialism, any state socialist system could be also colonialist and could actually use dehumanizing methods that we find in capitalist empires. So that was an interesting thing, I think, that I wanted to investigate at that point. And I discovered for myself, among others, the colonial thinking uh, represented by Kehano. And uh, uh, I thought that it actually was better uh, in trying to explain what was happening, because the concept of modernity at large, with this darker colonial side, explained better and actually was more inclusive of different other empires that did not fit maybe into this ideal capitalist first hand, first class capitalist empire of modernity, the Western Empire, like the British Empire, for instance. And of course, that would speak if we speak about uh, Tsarist Empire and then Soviet Union, if we speak about the Ottoman Sultanate and today's Turkey, if we speak about uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, these are not classical and the capitalist empires. They are not Western or not quite Western in some cases, right? They are not Christian and all of these are important factors. Mm, and also, of course, when we go through this shift that happened with the coming of Bolshevism, uh, that's, that becomes, everything then becomes even more complicated. And it's very hard to explain still to many of my colleagues uh, who are coming from post-colonial framework, all right? Because uh, they think that, well, if you read any Soviet text, early Soviet text, you see that, uh, you know, Soviet Union was always on the side of the third world countries. It was for internationalization, for international uh, cooperation, for uh, against co colonialism and all that. Yeah, it was written on the on the on its banner, so to say. But what it was actually doing with so many people who were um, you know who belong to all sorts of uh, regions and very different. Uh, I mean, it's uh, the the varieties are amazing because if you go to Siberia, you find indigenous people there as well. 
or north. If you go to the my native Caucasus, you find many, many different ethnicities, with different cultures were also colonized and many of them almost uh, destroyed, like my Circassian culture, for instance, was a genocide in the 19th century and most, most of the people just were destroyed, uh, assassinated. Uh, and then, of course, there's always this uh, additional issue uh, when we speak about corruption. Um, and, it, and it concerns precisely the Eastern Europe. Yeah, the Baltic states or other examples of Eastern Europe, you know, they, they became part of, of the Russian Empire uh, uh, actually, I mean, long ago. It wasn't with Bolshevism, not all of them, right? Uh, but of course, at that point, they were, there was in many cases no, no statehood yet. And that's why today, for example, in many Baltic uh, narratives, uh, anti-colonial and slash anti-Soviet narratives, it is the Soviet colonization that counts more and is more important because it happened when these countries already uh, became nation states and were independent countries and that's why it's so painful. It's much more maybe painful than uh, something that happened in the 18th century. Uh, so that's, 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 that makes the whole thing complicated. And another thing is that, of course, um, uh, when we go to Eastern Europe, uh, then the question of who is more European and who is less European becomes very important and very sensitive. Uh, and in many cases, we read this sort of thing like this Russian Empire or slash Soviet Empire was and is so Asiatic. And this is, a, I mean, it's a recurrent phrase that um, it's, um, you know, how can such an Asiatic empire uh, colonize a European nation like, like any of Eastern European nations? And of course, it's a very, very problematic statement because it's racist itself, uh, yeah, the, in, in relation to Asian people and Asian in general. But the, the, uh, the reason why it comes up is very important. And in order to understand this, we have to deal with the idea of um, imperial difference. And again, this idea is something that I uh, first read in one of the decolonial texts, and then we decided to go deeper into that with Walter Mignol and wrote several articles together and then a book in which we uh, kind of try to explain how it works. Uh, now, let me find a slide. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the idea is that when we shift from the first class, these modern capitalist empires, classical empires, such as Great Britain or France, uh, and try to make sense of these other empires, like the Russian Empire, the Soviet Empire. Uh, it's important to see that they are all part of the global modernity slash coloniality. And uh, this global coloniality is grounded in agonistics. It's grounded in rivalry. It's grounded in the fact that everybody wants to become better, uh, to win, right? So there's a race between different empires and today, of course, it didn't disappear, it still exists. Uh, and so there are some first great empires, classical empires like Great Britain and, and uh, France, and there are also second rate empires uh, or subaltern empires as they're sometimes called. Uh, I called Russia in my, one of my early works um, a genus based empire empire that looks in two different directions, two different phases, and I will try to explain now why. Uh, but of course, if we speak about the first phase of modernity, um, I mean, the 16th and 17th century, uh, we also had these empires that later became second rate or later became marked by imperial differences, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Uh, because uh, they were successful at first, but then they lost to their more powerful rivals and became the so-called South of Europe. Uh, and um, then there is this external imperial difference like Russian Empire, Soviet Union, the present Russian federations. Federation also, that is the case of the external imperial difference. External because it's not really European, right? Because it doesn't belong to European sameness. Uh, it's connected with a different, um, you know, linguistic map, different non-European religions, economic and ethnic racial models, and um, that, of course, is uh, something that is important to take into account and still remember. Because I think that uh, in many things that happen today in post-Soviet Russian history can be explained through this complex. It creates an inferiority complex of an empire that feels that it's not good enough, 
it's constantly trying to catch up with the West, with the, with the good empires, like you know, the winning empires. And I mean, of course, today we don't have empires in the proper sense of the word, but there is, for example, the United States that is also seen as an empire, as the empire. So there is this constant race, right? And uh, it continues throughout the Russian history as an empire. We see it uh, already in the 18th century, but we see it also in the 20th century. We see it in the Bolshevik history, I mean, the Soviet history, when uh, this slogan of um, catching up uh, with the West and leaving it behind uh, was very popular. And of course, we see it today in a very aggressive and bitter form of Putin's uh, politics. Right. Uh, um, so, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, this complex is something that Russia hasn't worked properly through. And here are some also examples I wanted to put together. Uh, maybe Russia and Turkey, because uh, Ottoman Sultanate also has Ottoman Empire has very similar sensibilities in that respect. And if we look at Russian, uh, in the, at the Russian case, I, uh, I use the example of Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, who, who is considered to be one of the Russian writers of the 19th century, right? Uh, but um, maybe he's a talented writer, I don't know, I never liked him, but um, uh, if you read not his fiction, but his diaries, you find really, really uh, amazing things there. And this is one quotation that for me shows the gist of this Russian empire being unsure of itself and at the same time wanting to join the West and be considered as an equal there, right? So he says, in Europe, we were hangers on and slaves, whereas in Asia, we shall go as master. And he says that in the um, 1880s, when Russian empire goes to Turkestan and uh, wants to conquer the, the, the Central Asia, uh, and this shows very well how unsure these colonizers felt in Europe, when when they were in Europe, at in, at any point, I mean, in any Europe, uh, and then of course we see it, something very similar in um, Turkish, a wonderful Turkish writer Orhan Panuk, uh, who also writes about the period when Turkey was going through uh, extreme modernization, and, and when uh, they were changing the you know everything from alphabet to clothes, and when he says that a customer who is buying this European clothes wants to buy a dream rather than just clothes, right? And I, something very, very similar, of course, happened in Russian, uh, in the Russian Empire as well and continued to happen uh, also, uh, also throughout its history. Uh, and uh, actually, there is a very strange inverted racial element there present. Uh, that again was very much recurrent, if you think of it, if you think of, um, you know, the representations, the visual representations of this thing. And this is what I mean. Um, you know, since the Soviet empire was so multi-racial and multi-ethnic, right, there were so many ethnicities and it was actually impossible to kind of keep them together. Uh, one of the tactics uh, was, for instance, when um, uh, the Soviet tanks were sent to Prague in 1968 uh, because of the uh, revolution there, uh, the, Prague, uh, the revolution against uh, the socialist regime. So when the tanks came, uh, it was important to send soldiers who were not even Russian looking, who were coming from uh, national minorities and who definitely didn't look European or white. So that was one of the one of the strategies of the Soviet Empire, which actually is repeated today in the war of, of, with Ukraine, as as far as I know. And I, I've read some materials on that, and that's also um, uh, one of the ways of kind of uh, you know using this um, uh, deficiency, as it's sometimes interpreted, in order to question this European belonging and and be connected with Europe, you know. And I mean, of course, it is all very problematic who is European and what is European and why is connected with whiteness of being blue eyed and blonde, you know, but at the same time, this is what, of course, what the empire uh, and, and the, uh, the propaganda uses on purpose uh, now in this war as well. Uh, so this is important, this imperial difference, because it allows us to understand how neurotic this empire actually is, 
and how unsure it is and how important for it is for 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 this kind of people you know like we deal with like putin for instance which, which is a very good example of that uh to uh kind of be considered on equal terms and when it doesn't happen then we see this aggression and we see this these reactions uh that are very evident today um Another interesting uh, idea that I recently discovered belongs to Laura Doyle, uh, who writes about interimperiality. And I think that maybe this idea is even more nuanced than imperial disrupt, because she describes actually the situation in Eastern Europe, and she shows how these different layers of imperial clashes and imperial intersections help us understand better what are the sensibilities of people living in, in Eastern Europe or Central Europe. And what she means is, of course, that you know that in even in modernity, there were several empires that were kind of, uh, you know, dividing these countries between their spheres of interest. It could be Tsarist Empire, it could be the Ottoman Empire, it could be the Austria-Hungary, uh, and, and several actually additional ones, the proto-imperial uh, say not not quite empires, but uh, more uh, like stronger countries, let's say, who also did that. And Germany, of course, although it's also not properly empire, but still it was also having this these influences, of course. And so that is also important because it also shows to us how when um, when these Eastern European countries are working uh, collectively on shaping their national identity entities and who they are, right? Uh, there are some elements of these imperial influences that are important and they are taken uh, into this new national narratives and others that are not, not interesting and not convenient anymore. So then they are forgotten and erased. And again, it's not bad or good, it's just a fact. And so we need to live. And we, it's very interesting and uh, actually important to see how these shifts uh, take place and how Certain histories they are revamped at certain periods and other and other periods not. And actually, this is what she writes about more at the one when she says that you know, most nations, including European nations, have emerged in relation to past and contemporaneous empires. And to grasp the conflicts of the national or transnational, we need to study the legacies of this multi multiple interimperial uh, history. Uh, and that, of course, yes, indeed, it also shows uh, how these inequalities, internal European inequalities were shaped, uh, hierarchies, clashes that remain invisible if we just continue using this homogenized nation state model or the EU rhetoric, for instance, because it often also hides the exclusion politics which exists uh, under this, you know, pretext of facade of democracy and universal human rights. Uh, and that, that is a, another thing that if we, if we consider, for example, some of the post-Soviet countries like Ukraine or like others, you know, several others, uh, you know, that they all are kind of divided in their closeness or uh, in their proximity to Europe and in their rights to, be, for example, uh, Part of EU, right? So, uh, some countries are uh, being held uh, for a longer time, and uh, and there's always this logic of being on probation uh, and uh, being not European enough, and not developed enough, and not transitioned enough. So, that's another interesting thing that we also find in many uh, Eastern European bitter reactions to uh, this. Like, okay, we wanted to return to Europe. We wanted to, 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 after all of these horrible Soviet influences, we want to be back with Europe. And then uh, when it doesn't automatically happen or when uh, the whole countries and nations are hold on probation uh, for a long time, and that's of course, there are many examples of that, right? Uh, that of course sometimes creates, um, you know, a reaction that is very similar to post-colonial reaction, you know? And there's, that's why there are so many, uh, people in Eastern Europe and thinkers uh, and activists who use um, post-colonial terms and concepts to describe their situation. For example, uh, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a group of very interesting Polish scholars uh, who were writing about subalternization of Eastern Europeans and saying that this is how they felt uh, within the core Europe. 
are and how they were seen as um, you know not quite european or not entirely european and not quite white so all of these nuances are also of course very important and need to be remembered when we discuss the situation uh, and unfortunately uh, this is not something that always happens uh, and uh, perhaps if we go a little bit back uh, in history and we look how what was happening in that sense with the Tsarist Empire, uh, it's not a chance that the Tsarist Empire is sometimes or often seen as a as a separate case. Because when when uh, you know the theorists uh, discuss the ways uh, the ways the empires kind of. Uh, you know, organized uh, colonization. They usually speak of the British model and the French model, again, as the most established ones, right? But the Xarist Empire in that sense was not, I mean, it was using different modes. It was borrowing modes uh, depending on who it was colonizing at the point. For example, if you look at early colonization models in I can say Beria, let's say, right, in the 16th century, 17th century. It's very much close to what was happening in the New World with the Amerindians. But if we look at the Caucasus, it's a different model. If we look at Central Asia, colonization of Central Asia, it's, it's also different. And of course, it was completely different when we speak about the Baltic countries, when we speak about Ukraine, uh, you know, and when we speak about some other European uh, kind of uh, geographical and culturally European places, because uh, of course, uh, very often these places were much more economically developed than Russia. They were much more culturally developed. I mean, if you look even at the amount of people who were literate in the Baltic countries, they were like 10 times more literate uh, than the, the Russian colonizers themselves. So that is uh, also a very important thing to keep in mind, like who was colonizing who and in what capacity. Uh, and it's interesting that this element of difference, uh, of in discrepancy, I would say even, it actually stayed like that even throughout the Soviet period, right? Uh, and uh, I remember very well in my childhood when it was impossible to go to uh, any capitalist countries because we lived behind the, the Iron Curtain the closest equivalent of capitalist countries were Estonia or Latvia. And so people dreamed of going there because that was what resembled the West. And that, that was something that everybody wanted to see, you know, at least to experience that. Uh, so that is uh, also an interesting discrepancy that you don't find, of course, in the case of other empires. And that's why the whole construction of dehumanization or othering of the colonized people cannot work the same way here in this case, right, as it worked in other cases. But in case of Ukraine or Belarus, uh, it's a, again a, a, a very separate case that you don't find in, in a classical cases of colonialism. Why? Because they are Slavic countries, right, and uh, culturally uh, presumably they are close to Russia, but that's of course a very much an approximation and simplification, right? Because uh, Ukraine, for instance, is very diverse, uh, as I'm sure you know now but after your lecture last week, uh, and uh, it is indeed divided between different cultural influences. And um, in that sense, it's very hard to say, uh, I mean, is it close? To Russia as Putin is claiming to do or is not because some of its parts I guess are and others are not uh, and um, uh, that's why uh, there is even a separate term in post-colonial theory russification right to, to, to russify something and that's exactly what happened with this in these cases of, of Ukraine and Belarus because when you say that your, your language doesn't exist it's just a dialect of Russian yeah this is what you do and then you force people to forget their language uh, and to create different forms of semilingualism, as they call them, we say semilingualism is a mixture in this case of Russian and Ukrainian, uh, and not the literary Ukrainian language, which is definitely from Russian. Uh, so this is a one way of kind of, you know, um, forced existence uh, and survival technique for this language and for this, and for this culture. Uh, and yes, yeah, so, so in, instead of 
the two classical terms that we have, annihilation or assimilation. So you either get rid of the people whom you don't like and you just, you know, you keep their land, but you destroy the people, what happened so many times in colonialism. Or assimilation, which we mostly find today, right? And it's more civilized, you don't kill people, but you force them to forget their culture. Uh, there, there, there was a specific way of working on it, which is called Russification. And it's interesting that in Soviet years, it has continued. And again, uh, if, you, if you ask somebody from the global south who is more, more or less leftist and communist or socialist, they will disagree with you and say, no, no, it was no racism in Soviet Union. It was all kind of, you know, equal rights and people could develop their cultures. But that's a very problematic thing because uh, you could develop your own culture if it wasn't Russian only in prescribed terms. So uh, the state actually created uh, fake copies of these national cultures and then forced you to practice them and believe that this is actually your culture. While everything that was questioning this uh, imperialism or colonialism, everything that was uh, maybe you know, uneasy, uh, everything that could, uh, you know, kind of call for uh, liberation or uh, independence, that was erased. Uh, that was completely and always erased. And there were tags for that in the Soviet times. For example, I remember that in many uh, socialist uh, national republics, mm, national intelligentsia that was questioning this was called um, nationalists, bourgeois nationalists, and many of them perished in Stalinist camps because of that, right? And so that was a tech, and actually today it's all revamped. It's all revamped in, uh, in Putin's Russia. Uh, so this imperial difference factor, it kind of connected in Russian case and in Soviet case with this specific, um, specific thing that uh, I call in one of my recent articles, I said something like that, that you know, um, Soviet Union presented recolonization as if it were decolonization. So uh, many people, many nations uh, that lived there, they were forced to believe that they were liberated by the Soviet Union, while in fact they were recolonized, very quickly recolonized. Because if we look at the early history, we see that after the World War I, after the collapse of the Russian Empire, uh, there were many nation states that shaped and that came to, to be, right? You find them in the Caucasus, you find them in, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, of course, you find them in the Baltics also. Uh, uh, but then um, most of them were very, very quickly within two or three years recolonized and lured back into the Soviet Union. And at first, it looked very luring indeed, because there was a kind of, a, you know, a discourse that we need to put uh, local national intelligentsia everywhere, the Soviet cadre, so to say. Uh, but that all changed quickly enough. Uh, and instead of that came the Russification and the idea that everybody has to be homogenous and we need to create one Soviet people with one socialist beliefs and one Russian culture behind it. And uh, again, uh, if you look at how it was all developing, you see these discrepancies. Like this, there were certain religions that were favored and others that were actually not allowed, right? Uh, because of course, for instance, the Soviet Union was always afraid of Muslim influences. And so it was trying to show that there are not so many Muslim people living there and the same continues today. Or if you take uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, it was of course persecuted, it's true, but then uh, slowly, little by little, it was revamped and it was allowed to actually practice Russian Orthodox Christianity, but it was not allowed to practice any other Christianity or it very much was uh, under pressure. Mm, so uh, that also shows that still uh, under all these uh, discussions of equality and proletarian internationalism and what have you from Marxism, in reality, it was not equal at all. And there were many people who were forced, as I said, to forget their language, to forget their culture. To, they, they even changed their names to Russian once, you know, so that uh, basically today they have very little to go back to. And that's a tragic thing for many people, you know, like they can't really do that. Uh, and um, yeah, so that is the darker colonial side of the Soviet Union. 
uh, and the state socialist modernity at large, because it's not only a Soviet story. We find something similar in other socialist countries as well, where national minorities were also not liked, or they were considered, you know, like uh, they were supposed to assimilate or disappear. Uh, and this uh, pattern of recolonization presented as decolonization um, that is very confusing to many people, uh, especially in the West, you know, because when they read something Soviet, they tend to kind of believe in the slogans, uh, while people who actually remember that and remember what happened, there's very few of those left, unfortunately, you know, that many, many of them perished and or they're very old and they're still afraid to talk. Uh, and that's actually very sad uh, because these real narratives and real histories and real testimonies can be easily lost. And then we will be just left with books, you know. Uh, and um, I, I mean, I, probably I shouldn't say that, but I cannot help saying this. Like in the last maybe 10 years or less, maybe seven years before this horrible war started, there was a very alarming tendency, I would say, uh, because especially in Slavic studies, in um, former Russian studies, you know, there were a lot of people in the West who never experienced any socialism, uh, any communism, but they started this revisionist tendency, saying like, oh, you know, when you criticize this, like I'm doing now, it's because you belong to the Cold War and you want to repeat these old-fashioned things. But in fact, we should rethink it. And in fact, Soviet Union was not so bad, and socialism was not so bad. And it's just because you're following these pro-Western ideas, and that's why you're saying this, you know? And um, it was very hard to talk with these people, because most of them, as I said, they were either coming from the West, and so they had a very nostalgic and romantic idea of what was really happening, uh, or uh, maybe they their families were somehow connected with these territories, you know, but they immigrated long ago. And so again, there was no connection. Uh, and um, at the same time, I somehow still felt that there was an element of, uh, you know, Eurocentrism there maybe, uh, or uh, maybe intellectual racism. Like they, they didn't want to listen to us. They just dismissed our opinion. And in some conferences, it was very obvious. Like, you know, we would see people from Eastern Europe and, or from, from larger post-socialist space. We would talk about something, but then there will be a Western person coming and saying, no, no, you don't understand. And then they will start explaining our own history to us. And that, that is what I'm very much against uh, because I think that we should hear more voices uh, from Eastern Europe uh, writing and speaking about what really we went through and what we are going through now. And it's especially important now for Ukraine also, because there are so many interesting Ukrainian thinkers. I know many scholars, you know, very critical, very nuanced, uh, but their voices largely, I mean, at large, they, they are not really heard yet uh, in, uh, in the international scholarly community. I mean, there are some very interesting artists also, but unfortunately, I mean, before the war, before this horrible thing happening, they were not really, really that very much known. Uh, and um, um, yeah, uh, so that is important. So the Soviet forms of coloniality were always misinterpreted uh, and uh, the global left and this romantic romanticization of state socialism, they continued for some time. And for me, the open question is how can we still have dialogues can there be a dialogue, for example, among the global south and the former socialist countries? Uh, and this is what I've been struggle, struggling with for quite a long time, you know. And as I said, there was this asymmetry. I could see that there's a lot of people from Eastern Europe who use the post-colonial terms, post-colonial concepts, and trying to describe their situation, especially after the collapse and when they had to enter capitalism, so to say, and become part of uh, broader capitalist terms. Uh, and uh, at the same time, when I tried to, when we tried together with my colleagues to interview people from the global south, it wasn't uh, this necessarily this readiness uh, to, to, to agree with us that there is a colonial element in, so, in Soviet history and uh, in the way, for example, national minorities are treated today in Russia or the way the post-socialist post-Soviet countries are treated by Putin today with this, what is happening there. 
And sometimes I see that their views are too one-sided, you know, because they tend to look for one uh, side, so to say, or who is to blame. Uh, in most cases, it's NATO and the West, the collective West that they read a lot. And this is appalling to me. And, and this is one of the reasons I kind of stopped speaking with many of my former colleagues who, I mean, we used to share a lot of ideas before and some of them the colonial colleagues also, but today I am strongly against their view because they tend to say that, you know, it's enough to be against the United States to be liked by them. And I find this very problematic. Because I think that, yes, of course, there is an element of them. I mean, the West is also maybe to blame for the situation today, but we cannot possibly take this black and white positionality here. Because uh, the fact that, for example, the United States did some horrible crimes in other countries does not mean that Putin has the right to do it with Ukraine. And this is, I find, very problematic in a, in a lot of discussions today by the leftists uh, broader in broader terms, right? And also by post-colonial and decolonial, some post-colonial, decolonial thinkers. Um, so um, I think that that's, that's another reason why we need to uh, actually go deeper into these histories. And I always answer this question, I say both are worse. Uh, it's not that I say that NATO is good and Putin is bad or the other way around. For me, both are worse in this situation. Uh, but of course, uh, we, we can not um, kind of, uh, yeah, assume, uh, assume that the atrocities of one empire allow other empires to be also you know, to do to all of these crimes and to be so dehumanizing. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also not new. It's something that we find all throughout history. This is what, uh, for example, the British Empire did in relation to the Spanish Empire in, in, with the, uh, the Black Legend. And this is what Russian Empire actually is famous for. Because throughout its history, it was always saying, not only now, it's not Putin's thing, but only already in the 19th century, it was saying that we never conquer anyone. We always come to liberate people from something or somebody. Uh, and uh, people never are conquered, they just want to join us out of their free will. This is one of the myths of the Russian Empire and also Soviet. Uh, and uh, today it's just revamped. It's just being used by propaganda, but of course uh, it has nothing to do with reality. Uh, it's simply not true. Uh, and um, uh, that's why, I mean, I'm finishing. I know it's time now to finish. Um, I more and more think about how these past things and how these histories are important for imagining any future, you know, because before we collectively think about all of this, in critical ways. We cannot really imagine a different future and different common future for us all, you know. And uh, of course, today the situation feels for all of us at, as if it's a cancelled future. And I think that a bad thing that also I noticed developing in the last five or six years uh, is this victimhood rivalries, as I call it. It's when small groups of people with very strong ad identity politics, they tend to fight for their cause, which is great and important, but then they never, almost never hear others. They never hear other stories of other victimhoods. And I think that in order to change the whole situation somehow, we need to start listening to others and really be interested in their stories, not in an official way, but, you know, to kind of make this journey to the world of the other with a loving perception, with genuine interest. And that's something that very rarely happens, unfortunately, because when you are living within modernity with this agonistics and with this idea that I have to compete, I have to compete, it's also a competition between rivalries and between saying who is a more victim and who is a less victim. And this is not productive at all. Because if we do that, we then reproduce modernity with its fighting and with its rivalry, rather than delinking from it in decolonial terms and saying, let's do something else. Let's build some sort of coalitions. Uh, and then the, the question is, of course, it's very hard to build coalitions to somebody who's far away, who is very different from you, whose history is completely different. It's a, it's a job. It's a very serious job for all of us. Uh, but I think that this is what we need to do, this kind of intersectional uh, coalitions, deep coalitions, 
uh, that can maybe refuture us, bring this possibility of future back to the world. Uh, I think I will stop at that because you must be tired. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Madina. Um, I don't know, it was very touching and I think very, very needful to hear. And I think at least two of us can definitely relate to what you what you said and the suffocating feeling that uh, that you get when no one is very much interested to listen um, or to understand you. Um, so once again, thank you. Um, we have now Q and A uh, time for Q and A. <laughs> so if someone has any question from the audience or comment. You can pose it. Or then maybe we start with a question. Um, um, so do you think this war in Ukraine will kind of greatly accelerate the colonial practices in the post-socialist countries? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, it's interesting that a little bit before the, the war, like maybe four years before, I noticed something started changing in that respect because i remember that for many years i was writing about this but nobody was really paying attention in russia for instance or even in, in post-soviet countries in most of them uh, and mostly i was talking about this in the west or in eastern europe sometimes in in, in countries that were already independent uh, yeah but not in russia itself and then all of a sudden i started getting these messages from younger generation of people in Russia who got interested in decoloniality and decolonization. And I think that unfortunately the war maybe in Russia stopped that process because most of these people are afraid to say anything now or they leave in, or they're leaving the country because you know, they're afraid to be arrested. And so in that sense, it will become uh, an exiled thing, this sensibility, but I don't think that it will die, no, because I mean, I. I mean, as much as I'm critical of Russia, I think that at some point this regime will have to go, you know, and then maybe maybe this sensibility will reemerge somehow. In Ukraine, I think for a long time already there is an interest in that, and it's very much now it's much stronger, of course, as, as a result of the war and uh, the strengthening of national identity and dignity, sense of dignity, and uh, yeah, you know, kind of self understanding i guess so yeah and also recently i was talking with people in georgia who was uh, who were asking me the same questions and i think that their sensibility is very close to ukrainian also uh because uh, as in case of ukraine yeah, they are not part of nato but are about i want to, to to become part of it and of course again russia is very much against it and as you know, there was a war in Ukraine several years, I mean, the war in Georgia also several years ago, and Russia keeps nibbling parts of it, like South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and others, uh, and precisely for the same reason, for the same kind of clash with NATO and, um, and the same idea of wanting to become part of European Union. So, yeah, and now there is a sensibility of, yeah, becoming free, decolonizing from, from Russian influences, finally. Thank you. Uh, we have one uh, question in the chat, which is, um, if uh, how does the speaker think the gaps can be closed? Mm -hmm. These are the coalitions you talked in the end. Yeah, of course, there is no recipe, right? But I think uh, in that sense, I like my favorite decolonial feminist, Maria Lugones. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away two years ago, uh, but she, she coined the term deep coalitions. And she talks that, you know, it's easy to speak of coalitions when people are identical, when they share political views. Uh, but she says, no, we cannot, we should think about coalitions that are grounded in differences. So that you are allowed to keep your differences to be different but at the same time you realize that there are certain causes that are very important and and that you have to still follow them and find some compromises with people with whom you may be different and of course we know about these major causes right that we all share 
uh, and one of them, of course, is like how how we restore peace and how we stop wars like that and how we make sure that they don't happen in the future, right? So that people don't suffer. Uh, or for instance, it's the climate change. Uh, and uh, again, is there a future for us as humans, as a, as a species, let's say, right? Uh, so there are things that kind of, in, uh, that are so important and global for all of us that we probably can forget about certain differences. Uh, and, and that's hard because as I said, the, the, the main thing, the mainstream thing is uh, to nourish your own identity politics. Uh, uh, and, but I, I think it's a really a dead end uh, because instead of that, we need horizontal coalitions. We need, you know, maybe um, communication that would not go through some authority. That is an interesting thing. So in this case, that so people would connect without Russia, uh, living in, in maybe in the same kind of small republics or you know enclaves, and they will connect. Uh, or without the West, uh, they won't have to ask somebody, but they would just. And I think that there are a lot of things like that in Eastern Europe. Regional coalitions are possible there uh, because of cultural links, uh, linguistic links, maybe, and historical links that people still have. Uh, and uh, that could be actually a way for the future, I think. I hope so, at least, because otherwise it's very sad to imagine the world with no coalitions like that. Um, Michelle asked a question. Michelle, do you want to ask yourself? Should we read it? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, um, I just like putting together my project. But um, so I was thinking, I mean, these are really beautiful ideas in theory. And I think execution wise is there are so many nuances to navigate on the ground, you know, because people do have conflicting, if not they hold many opinions um, and, and people are just complex beings. So how could these horizontal coalitions form on the community level, um, you know, regardless of where we are in the world? Um, but in, in the context of what we are talking about today, uh, if this question makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, again, there are no recipes because as you said, all, uh, all, all um, locales are different and uh, they have specific histories that are very complex and need to be taken into account. So the problem is that we are used to this when people have a recipe and then they try to impose it forcefully on everyone and this is not something this it will never work and shouldn't work and that's why soviet union collapsed you know and that's why modernity is collapsing today so the point is to do it grassroots and make it from the bottom up right so it's the people who should actually come up with these decisions and and through a dialogue through a very careful and patient work together and through maybe conscious refusal to follow this agonistic logic and trying to compete always and to say that my my story is more important than others and i don't want to listen to others and i don't want to know anything about the others so that has to be overcome and uh, of course when you work with people's minds like you you work to think together with the people right and also make together maybe if we talk about design or do this tinkering thing right uh so then uh, then this is a way of changing something but it shouldn't be like okay first we come up with a theory and then we impose it on people no we actually learn from people uh and uh, from people who live on for example some territory where different cultures clash or collide somehow right and how do they find ways of survival and what sort of things they design or make uh, or kind of you know that that's what i mean i mean i think this is a, this is the point that we learn from them ra rather than we come with some recipes for them how to live uh, at least this is what uh, i think we need to do somehow I wonder if there's other questions from the audience. Um, I have one uh, regarding uh, nation states and, mm -hmm. and, and nations uh, themselves. I want I wanted to ask your opinion because um, do you think to think of post 
nation state world is a privilege to think do you think that until we are all on the same level um we cannot really uh, be really as you said just before imposing one recipe as a non-nation state until such a empires like russian empire exists which is threatening to actual nation state which is ukraine mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's a very complex question because on the one hand i am very skeptical of the nation state uh, because i also think that it's an outdated institution and also being a person of very mixed origins i don't belong to any cultures you know and i have many languages and so i i don't like any sort of nationalism because i think that even the positive ones the anti-colonial nationalisms they also tend to later become negative and excluding that happens in many cases of anti-colonial nationalisms you know that later when the nation state becomes independent then it's used uh, internally against minorities and we know many many examples of that so that is a, a very tricky thing but on the other hand i think that in an extreme situation like ukraine there is exactly that it's a clash of the old empire which mostly has no kind of no rights to exist right uh, and uh, the nation state for which it is important to claim its nation stateness and its rights and its identity uh, and you know a lot of theorists they wrote about that and many of them said like oh you shouldn't again impose this western norms and say that everybody has to go through certain stages you know and uh, because again it's something like you are determining for other people uh, what they have to go through and you regard the nation state as the best norm for everyone which maybe it's not right and when you speak with people for example i have a very good friend here who is writing about stateless nations and he writes that it's interesting not all stateless nations want to become states some of them do but others are fine with that you know they don't think that nationhood is such an important category and they would rather have some rights some um you know uh, maybe independence to some extent, autonomy, some economic rights, cultural rights, but they are okay living within other larger states, let's say, right? For example, Kurds, if we take the, the example of Kurds. And there are others too. Uh, and so in that sense, I mean, I think that the nation state as an institution is in a state of flux now. And maybe at some point and very soon, uh, it will become outdated, but at the same time, at this point, we cannot do that, right? Because the world is a mess, uh, and there, there is nothing that controls uh, uh, what is happening except for this outdated, but some kind of structure of nation states, because UN, everything works with that, right? But on the other hand, you know, I, I'm writing a book now about unsettlement as a new human condition. And I'm thinking that, you know, when you read uh, about things like uh, climate change, about the flooding of huge territories, the change of, of everything, we know that by the mid 21st century, that is very close from now, there will be huge territories which will be unlivable. And so we will have millions and millions of refugees. I mean, now we have a lot already, right? Because of this horrible war, for instance, and with this Syrian conflict before. But that will be like dozens of millions of refugees because they will not be able to survive. And imagine that, what will happen with the, with the system of nation states and borders and border controls when there will be like millions of people trying to escape, you know, because uh, you know, the, they cannot, there's nothing to eat, for instance, because, it was a drought and everything became a, uh, you know, a, a desert. So that is something that I find very problematic in contemporary political discourse, because I think that politics fails precisely because it cannot think ahead. You know, politicians are, are still living within this 19th century geopolitical thinking of dividing territories. You know, like a, a good example is Ukraine. Instead of thinking of how to save humanity, and the planet, how to think that within 30 or 40 years, we won't have this catastrophe because then nobody would care about nation states. People will be just, you know, it will be a huge, huge movement of, and, and unsettlement of people and then nations. And, uh, so, so I think that 
it's it's a very complex thing like there is this larger and slower maybe logic of changing the nation state but of course when we speak about ukraine it's like a very very clear case of what happens when yes it's important for the people to have a nation state to have a national identity to be independent and then we 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 have this outdated amorphous uh, proto-imperial or i don't know post-imperial something in case of russia that is trying to yeah take over yeah thank you so much um is there any questions we have lots of questions uh, we <laughs> I have one question. So in one of your book, your book, uh, What Does It Mean to, po to Be Post-Soviet? Uh, you conclude with a chapter which is called People Are Silent. And silence there refers to uh, political apathy in Russia. And you name, uh, you name that silence as a possible form of resistance. And later on in the text, you raise a question, how much of fear and how much of actual resistance uh, does the silence contain? And so within, with, these, uh, with this war in Ukraine, how do you see the notion of silence in Russia now? How did, the, did your view change kind of from, from this the thing you wrote? Mm. Well, I mean, yes and no, because actually I think the feeling is very much the same. It's just that the war hasn't started openly then. Because, I mean, when I was writing, the war was already going on in Donetsk and Luhansk, right? It was just not, again, called war, but it was already there. So that feeling was there. Uh, and I think I was thinking more back in the history of the Soviet Union also, when there were many people who were against the regime, but they, not many of them were allowed to say anything and could say anything. And that's why they developed this culture of silence, uh, you know. Uh, and many of them still are afraid to speak because of this mass uh, repressions. And I think that, I mean, of course, it's hard for me because I'm not in Russia, you know, so, and I cannot believe in propaganda from any side. So I cannot tell you, like, if it really changed in Russia. And of course, I mostly deal with people who are very critical of what is happening. Uh, and these people are, you know, they are not silent. They're actually more and more saying something. And But they escaped or they're in immigration or something. And uh, that's a different thing. But for those who are there, um, I, I don't think actually that there is like 80% of support for what is happening, as is sometimes we read. I, I don't think it's relevant, this information, because... Um, usually how these uh, things happen is like with the polls, you know, that the sociological polls, well, they call people and you can actually hang up and you can not answer the questions if you're against, right? And you, if you're afraid. Uh, and so this is about 10 people, 10 percent of people who actually answer and uh, agree to say something. So out of the 10 percent who agree, there's 80 percent who uh, are pro-Putin, let's say, and pro-war. Uh, but there is a, a huge amount of people in Russia that I'm aware of uh, who are very amorphous and who are actually not interested in anything political at all and they don't want to think. And this is actually some, some sort of uh, people that were, I mean, artificially raised there. You know, it's, it was on purpose done uh, in these 22 years of Putin's regime, like to, to give people some sort of consumerist happiness you know, uh, of course, not to all of them, maybe again for 20 percent of uh, the small middle class living in St. Petersburg and Moscow, uh, who had the chance to finally, you know, become consumers in the Western sense. Uh, and uh, in, in, in return to that, also be silent and never say anything, right, and never go into politics. And so as a result of that, yeah, we have, we have this majority, unfortunately, there. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, of course, I hope that the people who left Russia uh, and um, uh, the critical generation, younger generation, they would uh, actually stop being silent and start saying something. Yeah, unfortunately, there is a risk here because I see that there is a lot of Russians who live abroad who are speaking now. And it's not always the people that I like to speak. I, I would like to hear let's say speaking, right? Because many of them are, you know, changing too quickly. And I remember that they were pro-Putin and they were 
for for the regime very uh, recently actually and now all of them became critics so there is a uh, there, is, there is this risk that these powerful people with names will take over this discourse of critique you know and of trying to imagine a different russia because there's already several parties created i think abroad different russia russia that is not putin's and when you see what they offer their agenda it's not interesting at all it's very kind of lacking imagination uh, and not being able to imagine indeed a different country in a different future so that's another thing that i find problematic unfortunately but it always happens you know with with uh, situations like that a collapse of empires Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I wanted to ask you then about the term <clears throat> Eastern Europe itself. Um, what does, in your opinion, still, what does it mean? What is the meaning of it? Does it have relevance when let's say Baltic states try to shy away maybe from this turn, they've been acknowledged as North Europe from UN. Um, it's it's a, lots of people are like, or also scholars uh, say that it's more about mental state than about actual mm -hmm. geographical mm -hmm. state and that it was created by, uh, by the West itself. This Absolutely, you are so right. I think that it's a it's a tag that West the West uh, the collective West puts on uh, these countries, right? And that is a way of keeping them at a distance to some extent. And and that's why it's understandable that the Baltic countries don't want to be called Eastern Europe, and either want to be Scandinavian or North Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah, because it's like you know the the concept of Balkanization, for instance, that was also created in a very derogatory way. Yeah, like to describe this sort of uh, position with uh, many civil wars and interethnic conflicts. And again, uh, it's it's using the term Balkans, I mean, the, the geographical term in order to refer to the state of mental state, as you said. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't like the term, but you know, the problem is that we have to address somehow the region. And that's why people struggle with that. Like, do we call it post-socialism? No, we don't want socialism. Because when you call it post-socialism, then a lot of people think that we're socialists, but improved ones. And so <laughs> they, they assume that we talk about socialism as an ideology, let's say, right? Rather than condition of being coming from the world that used to be socialist and now is not anymore, right? So it's more a descriptive description of your geopolitics and corporate politics and where you come from rather than your political views. Let's say. That's why it's not a good term. And Eastern Europe is also, it's a very regionalist term, which has this element of, yeah, okay, so we put you there. But then, I mean, all of this is so arbitrary. I remember once I was teaching a course in Germany many years ago, and I asked them, do you know the students where, where they kind of are, Europe ends and Asia starts on the continent, Eurasia. And it's interesting that students who were from Western Germany, they said, well, Asia starts in Berlin, in where, where East Berlin starts. So for them, anything that was connected with socialist history was already Asia. And those who were from East uh, Germany, they said they learned it from Soviet style textbooks. And so they use a geographical term terms and divisions and they said well Asia starts in the Ural Mountains so everything that is to the west of that is actually technically Europe which of course nobody agreed with and then there was a guy from Mexico there who said you're all wrong because it's it's all gone these divisions into west and east what matters is north and south and so in that sense both Russia is north and America is north and so for me it's the same there is no difference and I'm I mean, of course, it's wrong too, but I think it's interesting how these divisions are, are superimposed onto one another and complicate the whole thing even more, right? So that's why we, again, with this Eastern Europe, we fall through all these divisions and descriptions because we are not North in the, the, the actual understanding of what they mean by a global North, right? But we're not South either. We're not post-colonial in that 
kind of classical understanding of post-colonial. We are different in that sense. And so there needs to be some, some term, but maybe we have to come up with it rather than wait for someone to call us something. Yeah, uh, there's a magazine, the Calvert Journal in London that uh, called us the, the New East, which is also, I think, kind of interesting that somebody uh, in London calls uh, Eastern European region a New East. Um, the New East. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a question for us then, you know, what's so new about it? Because for us, it's been like this forever. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, exactly. Great. I think we maybe have time for one more question. Uh, or comment and <clears throat> and if there's nothing from the audience um <clears throat> some of us also had this question how would you see maybe the difference of the, the shifting power dynamics uh, between let's say russia and west or russia russian europe or maybe in the world in, in general um and do you think it could really shift or is it just now we're talking about sanctions, we're talking about how Putin is bad, and then let's say war is over, someday mm -hmm. partially maybe some territories occupied, occupied, and um, we forget, or we don't forget for sure, but countries who are benefiting from Putin's regime forget? No, I hope not. No, I, I think that this time is very serious and I see some shifts and I think that as it happens very often with empires like that, uh, it will actually be the end of the Russian empire. And I, I feel very similarly to how I felt in the 1991, maybe when the, the Soviet Union was collapsing, you know, like, uh, because all of these regions that are against the center there, they will now use this opportunity to become independent. So I am really hoping that it will happen. Uh, and of course, it will be very hard for the people in Russia, you know, because it will probably lead to a civil war of some sort and to repressions and to really horrible regime, but it will finally collapse. And so I don't think it will come back to normal or to status quo situation. No, no. Okay, I think we have to round it up. Um, we want to thank you very much once again. It was a beautiful and uh, presentation lecture, very needful. And um, thank you everyone who stayed with us till the end. Uh, we appreciate those who, who came and listened. Thank you so much again and uh, see you in on 12th of May. We have a panel discussion online and yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was an interesting lecture and interesting questions. <laughs>